Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in it, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. Now, you know, there was a time when I would have thought that I'm preaching a word today that somebody needs to hear because the devil has done everything that he could this morning <laughs> to make sure that things were askew. <laughs> so I don't know who this message is for, but hopefully there's a word of encouragement for someone. And we will make sure that as hard as he tried, the devil was not able to steal your blessing this morning. <laughs> While we are here, we have to do our part. While we are here, we have to do our part. Now, when I wrote that, it sounded like as good a title as any for a message drawn from our text for the morning. For like many pieces of scripture, it has a specific point of historical origin, yet it is timeless in both its counsel and its demand that wherever we find ourselves, whatever time we find ourselves in, whatever space we find ourselves in, we have to do our part. The specific people to which it was written were those Israelites who found themselves in exile from their homeland, in exile in Babylon, they had come to be there because the tides of history had turned against them. A lifetime, really, they were in a place they would rather not have been, dreaming daily of a place and a time that is now long gone. There are people who are wishing for another space at another time, and they are gladly rewarding the prophets who continue to tell them to live in another place and live in another time. To not worry about this place because we're only strangers and sojourners down here just passing through. But God said to them, no. This is the place in which you find yourself. And in its prosperity, its well-being, you will find your own. Now, as a child of an era in the last century who wore my fair share of polyester <laughs> and sported a rather sizable afro, I mean, my hair grew more in a week than it does in a year now. <laughs> there are things that I miss about that time. So there are things that I miss about that era. Number one was a finely crafted audio system, a stereo system. Some of you remember that you bought the components individually. You brought the preamp, you brought the tuner, you brought the reel-to-reel, -reel, you brought all of those pieces, and then you would set an entire room up <laughs> that was built wholly around your stereo system, and I would lose myself 
and listen for hours with little guilt. I miss those days because now I just Bluetooth into a Bose uh, portable radio and that has to do. What I also miss were predictable seasons when I knew what the season would bring. I knew what that meant for my garden. I knew what that meant for my haberdashery, but we are in an uncharted territory now. But there are also things I didn't miss, and I don't miss at all. I don't miss polyester shirts in the summertime. I mean, I don't like them much, but in the summertime, I don't miss them at all. Some uh, uh, things I don't miss are cars with no air conditioning. I don't miss that at all. I don't miss the time before central air conditioning. That's not something that I miss at all. But in the grand sweep of time from then till now, I think what I missed the most of that time was the naivete that we as a nation had come through an epic struggle in the 1960s and that the better angels of hope had set us on a path on which we all might find and have a place to flourish and call home. I remember the kind of optimism that I had in the 70s and in the 80s, and I missed that. A place where our children might have food security. Somehow, I don't remember as many hungry children in the nation in which I was young. Somehow I don't remember as many homeless people at every stoplight in the nation in which I was young. Somehow I don't remember there being a crisis in which the Supreme Court had made it illegal to actually be in public spaces simply because you were unhoused. I miss those times and I miss the at that nation, a place where our children might not only have food security, but acceptance and care so that their thoughts and dreams might be of building a better tomorrow for the whole world and not just for surviving today. I can remember careless summers where the entire summer was spent on a bike riding all over Queens, New York, half of the places that if my mother knew she would have been horrified. <laughs> now, I sound wistful for that time because it feels in these last years that some wicked act of necromancy has brought back to life the forces that would make many of us second-class citizens and others prisoners of the various closets of our society, and still yet others prisoners of their humanity that had been reduced to gender and reproductive capacities. These have been the worlds we've lived in for the past years. Scanning up my feeds, watching the news, it can sometimes feel as if dreaming of a better world for ourselves and for our children can seem like a fool's error. And yet, and that was actually the second title for a sermon I was playing with, and yet, <laughs> our scripture for the morning recalls us to the work of hope. For what is seeking the welfare of the place in which we find ourselves as a people of faith, if not the work of hope? What is the call to plant ourselves here to make this place, this time, this era, all that it can be for God's children and God's creation? What is that if it is not the work of hope? Now, let me be clear. This text is not calling us to wait until the end of history. This text is not eschatological in nature. And there's the 75 cents. <laughs> not eschatological in nature. Rather, the text is calling on the people of God, you and I, and all the people of God, to invest themselves fully 
in working and seeking the welfare of the time and place in which we find ourselves. We may wish we were someplace else. We may wish that the politics of our nation were different. We may wish that the distribution of the goods of our society were different, but they're not. The point is we are someplace, sometime, and God calls us to seek the best that we can for the people and for God's creation in the place in which we find ourselves. To seek the welfare and the flourishing where we are. To take seriously our civic responsibility so that we and our children might have a better future. Sometimes this is a hard thing. It can seem the grip of yesterday is always more powerful than tomorrow's invitation. That's why whenever nostalgia begins to cloud our minds, the nostalgia is a wonderful thing. Half of the sermon was about nostalgia. But if I tried to take you back to the 70s, I would be taking you back to a time that is long gone. And I'd be asking you, to live in a time that is dead and gone. Because there is nothing in the past that is alive. So whenever someone tells you to make anything great again, what they're asking you is to stop living in the moment in which you're living and to try to create some sort of false image of what the past was. So I know it's sometimes hard to re remember that we've been called to hope because the future is unclear, and so the past can seem more powerful. Sometimes it can seem that the architects of closets, inequality, maldistribution will be the designers of our society's future. Sometimes it seems as if those who want the worst for all of us are going to be the ones who have the loudest voice in terms of what happens to all of us. But for people of faith, who are followers of Jesus, we know that this is just an illusion. We know that it is just an illusion that we are in a time and a place that we are rendered powerless. We know that it is just an illusion that we don't have the power as the people of God to make of this world a better world. We know that it is just an illusion that we don't have the strength to do the work to make of this place a place where justice, where hope, and where love and mercy rule supreme. For people of faith, for followers of Jesus, we always have to remember that deliverance is just over the hill. That deliverance is just over the hill and that the long night that it seems we're about to be plunged into is one that will simply be erased by the shining of God's sun and the day. And so it was with the people of our text for the morning because if we go back and read the text, the people actually went home from Babylon. They had invested to make it a place that they could find hope and fullness while they were there, but God delivered them again and again. They lived their lives. They did what they could to help the society flourish, to make it a better place for all. And deliverance came in their return to the land. That's what our text is about this morning. Now, the two things I want to close with, one is that our text was written about and to a people living under a monarchy. So what it meant to be civically responsible was appropriate to that time, yet the call to do so was clear, as it has been for millennia. So whether it be a monarchy or a democracy such as ours, we still have the same responsibility 
to live out the civic responsibility of making this place, this nation, this city, this state, all that it can be for all of God's children and not just for some. We have to use whatever power we have. We have to use whatever strength we have to make of this world, to make of this place something of which God can smile. As a people of faith, we live in a time in which our society is turning its back on too many people, in which there are too many people needlessly suffering in which there are too many people needlessly going without. It is our responsibility while we are here in this place to do our part, to make of this place a better world. So you do what you can to make your society a place where all of God's children can shine in the glory of who God made them. Second, let us be mindful that the welfare of any society is linked to the presence of justice in that society. Scripture is replete with stories of empires that have fallen because of their unjust treatment of God's children. History is replete with nations and with empires that have fallen because injustice was the byword when God demands justice. So the thing that I want you to take from this message is that your civic responsibility is to work for the welfare of this place to which God has brought us. And remember that that welfare means nothing without the presence of justice. So we are called to do justly in this city, in this state, and in our nation. And we are called to use all of the strength that we have in our limbs, in our minds, and in our hearts to make of this place a place upon which God looks upon us. And because of the presence of justice, because of the presence of hope, and because of the presence of mercy, God smiles upon us and brings us a brighter day. Yes. Amen.